The De Vendrines were French aristocrats. They owned several very expensive pieces of property, including the Chateau Martel in Montflanquin, France. The family was well-respected and very active in the upper echelon of French society. But even their cultured, highly educated family was no match for a modern-day Rasputin, a con man who, over the course of a decade, managed to bring the entire family to their knees. And the things they believed, down to the very core of their beings, well, those come straight out of a work of fiction. They were lucky to get out alive. Welcome to Margs and Mayhem, where I tell you a true crime story and we drink. The following content may be disturbing to some. Discretion is advised. If you choose to enjoy one of our themed margaritas, make sure you are of legal drinking age and have fun, but drink responsibly. Today's drink combines our favorite American drink with another famous French one, the French 75. It was created first in 1915 in Paris and is a variation on the Tom Collins, using champagne instead of sparkling water. So for this drink, we're going to mix together one part tequila and one part gin. I actually did a half an ounce of each one because we're also going to add four ounces of champagne. We'll then put in one half part of lime juice and one half part of lemon juice and a little bit of simple syrup to taste. I didn't need to add any. You're gonna mix all your ingredients together in a shaker. Don't forget when you've got the carbonated stuff, you've gotta be careful. And just in case, don't make this in a carpeted room. Then strain over fresh ice in a salt rimmed glass. Mmm, classy. Thierry Tilly was born in 1964 just northwest of Paris. His father was a driver and his mother was a licensed midwife. Before Thierry would make his fateful run-in with Guylaine Vadrin, he would first enter and drop out of law school, fail at business, and have at least one other run-in with the law. He was convicted for fraud in the year 2000 for using corporate assets for personal reasons. He got married and evidently is still married to either a cosmetics executive or she might be a model, and they have two children together. The Vadrines span three generations. I'm going to explain the family members and how they're related once, and then throughout the episode, I'll make sure to talk about how they're related so that it doesn't get too, too confusing. Guillemette was the matriarch. She was 88 years old at the time, and she had three adult children. Philippe was a 63-year-old Shell executive. Charles Henri, who was a 53-year-old physician and local politician, and the husband of Christine. So Charles Henri and Christine are married. And she also had a daughter, Guylaine, who was 55 and ran a school in Paris. Philippe had a girlfriend named Brigitte. And like I said before, Charles Henri and Christine were married. Those two had three children themselves, Guillaume, Armory, and Diane, and the youngest, Diane, was 16 at the time. The grandchildren really play ancillary roles in the story, so the most important people to remember are those adult children. Charles Henri and his wife, Christine, Philippe and his girlfriend, Brigitte, and then Guillaume. Easy, right? I guess. Guillaume was the director for the Le Femme Secretaire in Paris and had been so for many years. It was a secretary school for girls, if you couldn't translate that quickly. It was there that she was introduced to Thierry Tilly. She was looking for someone to upgrade the school's computer system and a friend of hers recommended Thierry. Evidently that friend recommended Thierry because Thierry owed that friend some money and so he thought that would be a way to get that money. I don't know, probably not the best reason to recommend someone, but who am I to say? Thierry quickly ingratiated himself with Ghislaine, mostly because he was so darn useful. He also was a very kind listening ear. Ghislaine began to confide in him the problems in her marriage and problems with her children. She would eventually hire Thierry to be a school administrator and he was really a top-notch problem solver for her. He was a nondescript, pale-looking fellow with wireless glasses and by 1999, he was Ghislaine's most trusted advisor and highest paid employee at the school. And by advisor, I mean brainwasher. 
Elaine started wearing super dark sunglasses even inside, started wearing all black clothes, and started raving about Freemasons being everywhere. When Ghislaine introduced Thierry to the rest of the family in 2001, they really trusted her judgment and brought him into the fold. Thierry quickly gained the trust of Ghislaine's brothers, Philippe and Charles Henri, because he made this wild claim that he would be able to get a 10% re return on any investments they made with him in a month. And for a while, he was able to do that. And money talks. Meanwhile, large sums of money started disappearing from the bank account at Ghislaine's school and they stopped paying the bills. By March of 2001, the school no longer had any money to pay its teachers. They actually still continue to teach at the school until the end of the term, which is uh, more, than, more than a little bit nice. By the fall, the school had totally shut down and for some reason, Ghislaine had taken residence on the top floor of the school. It didn't have any electricity or any heat or any running water, but for some reason she was living up there. Her brother Philippe and his girlfriend Brigitte also moved up into that top floor of the school and lived there until December of 2001. In late 2001, after having been indoctrinated by the stories of Thierry Tilly, the entire Vadrine family began to really abandon their lives. At this point, the family moved in together to the Chateau Martel that was in Montplain Quinn. Abruptly, brother Charles Henri sold his medical practice, left, got rid of at least two other houses and gave all of the proceeds to Thierry. They all stopped paying their taxes. The family was being held captive in the home by their own brains. They spent hours in darkened rooms, not even knowing what time it was. They had removed all the clocks and the calendars from the home. Even if Thierry wasn't there, he kept tabs on them at all hours of the day by phone and email, sometimes sending 40 emails a day. They barricaded themselves in, convinced by Thierry that if they left, they would be murdered. The Vadrine family was suddenly the recluses of Montflan Quinn. Charles Henri and Christine's daughter, Diane, would later say, quote, psychosis is a glass that fills every day, drop by drop. In the beginning, it was the Freemasons. At the end, it was everybody who walked their dog. Tilly succeeded in putting a psychological pistol to our heads, end quote. At some point, Thierry turned Ghislaine against her then husband. After being directed by Thierry to banish him, he was given 30 minutes to pack up his things and then was sent off to Paris, where he discovered that his bank accounts had been, had been emptied. They would divorce in 2003. He would say in a Vanity Fair article years later, quote, Thierry Tilly was a sort of brain burglar. He opened their heads, took out their brains, and put in a new one, end quote. Yeah, I'd say so. In 2003, a regional newspaper published an article about the family and their strange new behavior. Montplain Quinn is a relatively small area with about 3,000 residents. A family that had once been active in the community and was now hiding behind closed curtains certainly did draw attention to itself. This was made especially clear where if one of them happened to be out in public. That was Ghislaine. She was the only one allowed to go out to like buy groceries and stuff. She would often accuse them of being part of the black masses or the gasp Freemasons. The family actually sued the author of the news article for invasion of privacy and won. I guess you can be as crazy as you want behind closed doors. But curiosity continued to grow. So at least in part to combat that, and then in part because they weren't paying their taxes, Thierry moved the entire family to Oxford, England, where they all took low wage jobs. One of them worked at a local ice cream parlor and another one worked at Burger King. They rented modest homes and gave almost all of their income to Thierry. Amory, one of Ghislaine's sons, would say, quote, all my money I gave to him. I couldn't buy a Mars bar. That was seen as a theft from the family, end quote. They continued to isolate themselves from the outside world. From November 2006 to spring 2007, and again in January of 2008, Christine Vitrine was targeted by Thierry and in turn the Vitrine family. Thierry convinced the family that Christine held the key. Really, a bank account number for a bank in... Brussels that held a secret to save the world. Christine actually believed it too, but no matter how hard she tried, she could not remember the number. Her own family drug, beat, and berated her. They deprived her of food, 
and they wouldn't let her go to the bathroom. She was held captive for six months. It was the first time that Christine had contemplated committing suicide as a way to end the torture. Eventually, Christine, desperate for relief, blurted out a random number, but that relief would be short-lived. They flew her to Brussels and had her walk up and down the street, going to every single bank and asking about an account under that number. But that was a random number. There was no bank account under that number. This was yet another lie invented and implanted by Terry Tilly into the Vadrine family. And because of it, Christine will walk with a limp for the rest of her life due to her torture. Philippe and his girlfriend, Brigitte, managed to escape from the family in July of 2008. And in March of 2009, Christine was also able to escape and go back to France. This was due in large part to a friend that she made in the Oxford cheese shop that she was working in. After months of prodding, she finally opened up to this friend, and this friend convinced her to escape back to France. She managed to do it with the help of a cousin, but she did leave without Charles Henri, her husband, who was still living in Oxford under Thierry's control. It would be Christine who blew the case wide open. She reported what had happened to her to French police. Between that and her brother-in-law, Philippe, agreeing to press charges, well, they filed some charges against Thierry. On October 21st, 2009, Thierry Tilly was arrested by Swiss authorities in Zurich and then extradited back to France. He was charged with fraud, abuse of weakness, violence against the vulnerable, and holding people against their will for up to seven days. But at this point, the family, for the most part, they were still sequestered. They were still off believing those things about Thierry Tilly and the Freemasons and all that crazy stuff. Lots of people were worried about them, including Ghislaine's ex-husband, who really believed that they were on the road to what happened with Jim Jones' cult, mass suicide. Christine's lawyer, who actually specializes in cults, along with a psychoanalyst, a criminologist, plus Christine, Brigitte, Philippe, and Ghislaine's ex-husband led to what they called exfiltration missions in late 2009. By November, Charles Henri and Christine's son, Guillaume, had been weaned from the family's influence. In December, it was announced that the entire family had been saved. On September 24, 2012, 48-year-old Thierry Tilly's trial began in Bordeaux, France. He at first denied any legal counsel, refused to do any interviews, and vehemently declared his innocence. Although I'm not sure who to because he didn't do any interviews and he didn't have a lawyer. Who knows? His lawyers, which he eventually acquiesced to, would lay the claim that the family actually participated willingly in his schemes. And the lawyer would also say that he was probably, quote, slightly deranged, end quote. Okay. You believe that about your own client. Preliminary psychological tests showed that Thierry was highly intelligent with an, a photographic memory. He, he kind of seems like he knows exactly what he was doing. Thierry would call the Vadrines a, quote, gang of resentful, greedy country nobles, end quote. Yeah, okay, they're the greedy ones. Thierry lived a pretty lavish lifestyle on the backs of the Vadreen families, including having an apartment in London and one in New York City. Thierry Tilly did not work alone. Jacques Gonzalez was the man that Thierry called the head of this secret organization that he had set up to protect the Vadreen family. It was called the Balance of the World. Jacques was arrested and charged as an accomplice. At his property, they found $107,000 in cash in the trunk of a BMW, many Rolex watches, and quite the luxury wardrobe. The Vadrines did attend both trials as a family. During the trial, it would come out all of the things that Thierry had convinced the family of in their decade together. This included, he was a descendant of the Habsburg monarchy of Austria, he was the son of an Olympic ice skater mother and a commando diver father. He once played soccer for Marseille. He worked in espionage as a master spy and could not discuss it further, yeah, naturally. 
He had a briefcase that would explode any time anyone other than him attempted to open it. The family was a vital link to a splinter group from the Knights Templar, known as the Balance of the World. This group helped in times of global jeopardy. They were on a quest to find a treasure trove so large that Thierry said it would not fit inside any room. Like, any room? Whatever. Their lives were under threat from a Masonic plot that only Thierry could save them from. Not only should they be afraid of the Freemasons, but the Rosicrucians, homosexuals, and journalists were all after them as well. Garden flowers are the sign of an evil network. There was no need in the world to have clocks or calendars. Time was not meant for them. And there were traitors within their own family. They were being bugged, followed, and spied on by lots of people, and that could include members of their own family. So for this episode, I don't think we need to go into the detail of what makes a destructive cult because that's pretty obvious, and I'll talk a little bit more later about the damage that the family is still enduring. And the family who lived it have made it pretty clear that the cult was destructive, so I don't want to listen to them. But for the purposes of this episode, I'm more curious about how a family like the Vadrine family gets wrapped up into all of this. Like, how does someone get sucked into a cult like the one that Thierry Tilly was in charge of? According to cult recovery therapist Rachel Bernstein, there are three main reasons that someone joins a cult. And um, I like short lists, so we're going to go with that one for today. First, people who join cults want to better themselves. I think there's a couple of examples of this. First of all, the brothers, Charles, Henri, and Philippe, they definitely wanted to better themselves financially, and they thought that Thierry Tilly could get that massive return on their investment. So that makes sense. I think that the entire family thought that Thierry could better their situation and he managed to convince them that they were in a pretty rough situation and only he could help them through. So that also makes sense. Next, people who join cults often want a greater sense of community. This one isn't, you know, on the outset making a lot of sense to me because they already are a community. They're a family, but families all have their problems and he probably told Ghislaine especially that he would be able to improve their family. And also, as things went on, it made it hard for members to leave the cult because they were literally leaving their whole family. They were abandoning their family if they chose to do that. So I can see how that might keep them in the group for way longer than they should have and also led them to just have this groupthink and belief system together. And lastly, and most importantly, people who join cults are often in a time of great personal vulnerability. Timing, they say, is everything. I don't have triangulated sources here, but there are some sources that say that Ghislaine was going through some things personally in her life that could have made her more vulnerable to being swept up under Thierry Tilly. And because Ghislaine was normally practical and had such good common sense, the rest of the family just took it at face value that he was a really nice guy who was going to help them. She gave a sense of credence to Thierry that he probably wouldn't have otherwise. And she was really the unwitting stamp of approval on what came later. So what do you think? Were the Vadrine family members innocent victims caught up under who the prosecution referred to as the quote, Leonardo da Vinci of mental manipulation, end quote? Or were they willing participants in the drama of Thierry Tilly? What would inspire a family to divest themselves of $7 million to a relative stranger? Spoiler alert, they lost $7 million. And what about all those crazy things he told them? How could they possibly realistically believe these things were true? What about Thierry's wife? How much of this do you think she knew about? Was she a party to it or like a totally innocent victim that didn't even know this was happening? I think that part's also wild. I've asked it before and I'll ask it again. How close are any of us to being wrapped up in a cult? In November of 2012, Thierry Tilly was convicted on all charges and sentenced to eight years in jail. After an appeal, he actually had his sentence increased to 10 years, so he's still in jail, at least 
at least for now, it is it has been 10 years. He hardly receives any visitors in prison, and he refuses outright to see his father, who actually testified to some of his lies in the trial. His cell is often moved, so he doesn't have the opportunity to brainwash fellow prisoners. Thierry's accomplice, Jacques Gonzalez, received four years for what he did. What about that 10-year sentence? Is that enough time for $7 million? Guillemet, the matriarch of the Vadrin family, died in 2010 at 97 years old. Christine and Charles Henri reconciled after the exfiltrations and moved together into a modest home with their adult children. Christine wrote a memoir titled We Were Not Armed with contributions from her children and her husband. Ghislaine has since moved back in with her ex-husband, who said Ghislaine, quote, had no trouble readjusting to normal life. She is no different in any way at all, end quote. Over the course of 10 years, Thierry Tilly did manage to finagle out of the Vadrine family somewhere between five and the more realistic estimate, seven million dollars. They simply poured buckets of money into a fake Canadian charity that Thierry Tilly said would protect them. Charles Henri would say Tilly, quote, stole 10 years of our lives, but he did more than that. He destroyed everything on the way. The family lost almost everything they had in terms of money and property, including their ancestral home, the Chateau Martel. They'll never be able to get it back. Thanks for hanging out with me. I sure do hope you never find yourself in the hands of a Thierry Tilly. I think that he could sell sawdust to a lumber mill. Sure do wish that guy would have used his powers for good instead of evil. My goodness. If you haven't given the Mars and Mayhem social media channels a follow, that's why I'm still talking about them. I'm just kidding. But if you wouldn't mind heading over and giving them a little, a little follow, that'd be great. Or Mars and Mayhem. Mars and Mars and spell out the word and if you couldn't find it before. And your monthly reminder to go ahead and rate and review the podcast on your favorite podcast listening app. Plus my regular plea to like, comment, and subscribe on YouTube. Next week, we're doing another case about a missing indigenous woman. And so we are not going to focus on the drink, but instead on the case and what small parts we can do to help a family that's seeking justice. I'll see you next week. And remember, there are always alternatives to murder and swindling a French aristocratic family for your own financial gain.